Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Back in the early days of the National Football League, many of the players were multi-sport athletes. For example, George Hallis of the Chicago Bears also played Major League Baseball with the New York Yankees. There is, of course, an old tale that the Babe Ruth was the replacement for him in right field for the Yankees when Hallis let go of baseball. That story's not true, but it's an interesting concept. Then there was Patty Driscoll, who played football with the Chicago Cardinals and was the highest paid player in the NFL in 1920, earning $300 per game when most individuals were paid $25 to $50 per outing. Driscoll, although standing just 5'7", also played pro basketball and was once a member of the Chicago Cubs baseball team. In this episode of When Football Was Football, we'll take a look at the short but brilliant career of an exceptional pro football player who is also in the Basketball Hall of Fame. For those who enjoy very deep dives into professional football history, you probably don't remember him as the person who also scored the very first NFL touchdown ever for the team now known as the Arizona Cardinals. More than likely, you have never heard of him and his amazing athletic accomplishments, both on the gridiron and on the hard court. So our focus today will be on Lenny Sachs, who was born in 1897 in Chicago. He attended Carl Schur's high school and apparently won 11 letters in different sports once even getting into minor trouble for his participation in more than one competition. On November 8, 1913, while still a high school senior, Sachs starred, according to the Chicago Tribune, for Schurz, in an important soccer, not football game, for Schurz. It was a 3-3 deadlock with Englewood High School. Schurz trailed 3-0 before Sachs led his team back in the final 10 minutes of the match. But then on November 13th, the high school board of control ruled that Schurz must forfeit that soccer game to Englewood because Lenny Sachs had been the starting quarterback for Schurz in its football game against Englewood on October 19th. Apparently, there was some type of rule in existence at the time that did not allow an athlete to play two sports during the same season. After high school, Sachs attended the American College of Physical Education and also enlisted in the service during World War I, where he played basketball for the Cleveland Naval Reserve and basketball team. He had also played some semi-pro football in Chicago with the Logan Squares and played left end. In addition, he was also the left forward, as it was called at the time, for a basketball team called the Mezzercons in 1917. After the war, Sachs joined the rough-and-tumble Chicago Cardinals team on Chicago's tough south side, managed by Chris O'Brien. Of course, O'Brien was one of the founders of the National Football League, or as it was called in 1920, the American Professional Football Association. Football season started a bit later back then, and the Cardinals failed to score in their first two league games, a 0-0 tie with the Chicago Tigers on October 10th, and a 7-0 loss at Rock Island on October 24th. But it was on October 31st that Sachs achieved his historical record in a 21-0 rout of the Detroit Heralds. But there were actually two milestones that Sachs established that day. Detroit and the Cardinals battled to a scoreless tie in the first half, but within five minutes of the third quarter, Lenny Sachs changed pro football history. 
first let's talk about his touchdown. As mentioned, the Cardinals were scoreless in the first two outings and failed to dent the end zone in the first half against Detroit. That adds up to 10 quarters without a point. But in the third quarter, Sachs hit pay dirt in a most unusual way, as described by the Rock Island Argus newspaper, which said, Three block punts in rapid-fire order by Lenny Sachs, Racine Cardinal N., were all converted into touchdowns and enabled the local team to turn back the Detroit Heralds with a 21-0 defeat at the Cubs Park. It's still amazing to think that one player could block three punts in one game, let alone one quarter. But Sachs did the job, and when he recovered the first block in the end zone, he also owned the very first NFL score in the long history of the Cardinals. The Argus newspaper then added a few more details to verify the momentous effort of Sachs, saying, Sachs' playing was sensational throughout the game, but in the third quarter he set a record which has probably been equaled few times on a football field. Three times he broke through the line and knocked the ball down before the punter could get rid of it. Once he recovered and scored the touchdown. So tracking down this type of record in the NFL can be challenging, and we could not find any other example of a player blocking three punts in one quarter. Two players, Steve Broussard of Green Bay in 1975 and Jim Frazier of Denver in 1963, are credited with three block punts in a single game. Sadly, the feat of Lenny Sachs is nowhere to be found. Sachs played pro football through 1926 with the Cardinals, Milwaukee, Hammond, and Louisville, all while maintaining a breakneck coaching schedule as well. His first coaching stint was at Wendell Phillips High School on the south side of Chicago, where he was in charge of both the basketball and football programs. In 1921, he moved over to Marshall High School on the west side of Chicago. And by 1923, while still playing pro football, Sachs took on the dual role of a coach at both Loyola University and Loyola Academy, a prep school. His basketball teams at Loyola University were among the finest in the country. Beginning in 1928 and extending into the 1930 season, the Hoops team under Lenny Sachs won an amazing 34 straight games. Then, from 1938 to 39, Loyola put together another 21-game winning streak, losing in the national championship game. Sachs was considered a defensive genius who developed a stifling 2-2-1 zone defense, which you never see anymore, that took advantage of the lenient rules at the time. You see, Sachs would position his biggest man under the basket, where it was open season on goaltending. As the big guys would swat away the shots, Lyola would grab the loose balls and head the other way. Although goaltending was outlawed in 1937, Sachs still employed a tight defense as his trademark for the Loyola teams. In 1939, Loyola finished 21-1 and was a runner-up in the National Invitation Tournament. He won 223 games at Loyola against only 129 losses over 19 seasons. His coaching wins are the second most in school history, and he was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 1961 was also Loyola's first athletic director from 1935 to 1940. Sachs died suddenly in October of 1942 at the very young age of 45. The school said in a release, We regard him as the finest basketball coach in the country, one who exercised a profound influence on the young men who came under his direction. Lenny Sachs a multi-sport athlete who made his mark as just a 5'7", 180-pound lineman back in the days when football was football. And we'd like to share one more brief story about an early Chicago Cardinal player who made a lasting impact in another field. His name was Herb Bloomer, and he voiced little interest in an NFL career but quietly became an MVP in a totally different world. While toiling in the trenches for the Cardinals from 1925 to 1930, and again in 1933, Bloomer pursued his doctorate degree from the University of Chicago. After completing his degree program, Bloomer remained on the faculty of Chicago until 1952 and served as a line coach on the school's football team under head coach Clark Shaughnessy. 
After leaving the University of Chicago, he became the chairman of the sociology department at the University of California, Berkeley, and was the president of the American Sociological Association. In his chosen field, the former lineman was considered an expert in the fields of collective behavior, social movement, race relations, social problems, and public opinion. And so the tough lineman from the University of Missouri, who specialized in defending his quarterback, moved successfully into his intellectual pursuit of sociology, in particular, symbolic interactionism. Bloomer was the first to use this term, and it is known as the founder of symbolic interactionism. He passed away on April 13, 1987, at the age of 87. Thank you for joining us on this episode of When Football Was Football, and we hope to be with you next time. We'll look at one of the ugliest marks in pro football history, the record 29-game losing streak of the Chicago Cardinals. When you hear this story, you'll never feel bad on Sundays when your favorite team loses two or three in a row. Thank you. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey, are you ready for some football? Some fantasy football? How about some daily fantasy football? Silly questions, right? Of course you are. You're ready to talk some smack and win some cash every Sunday, and Thursday, and Monday, and whenever there's football games. The Sports History Network invites you to play your daily fantasy football this season at thrivefantasy.com. Thrive Fantasy offers hundreds of thousands, millions in cash every day on NBA, MLB, PGA Golf, Cricket, Esports, and of course, NFL football. Every week during the 2021 NFL season, Thrive Fantasy has pool play contests and heads-up matches with prizes of all sizes, and even free play contests for real money. Sign up with Thrive Fantasy today to get a 100% match bonus on your first deposit for up to $100 in free daily fantasy football play. Visit sportshistorynetwork.com slash thrive, that's T-H-R-I-V-E, or enter promo code S-H-N when depositing at the cashier. Join Thrive Fantasy today, earn cash prizes, and support great shows like this at the Sports History Network. Now that's a win-win-win situation for you to kick off your own NFL season. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.